Gentlemen, you have to break down and get into some of the details about your partnership, what the day-to-day -day looks like right now, and uh, what you guys are excited about, what you've discovered along the way, how things have changed, how the tech's improved. I mean, wherever you want to start, what's on your mind at the moment? You know, a lot of people, um, especially down the Treasure Coast, where they're harvesting ships that have been known about for 40 years, mm -hmm. the big one of the big differences in what we're doing is we're looking for brand new shipwrecks, ones that have not been found before. Right. So an uh, example in the 1715 fleet, which is the one that the Treasure Coast is known for, those shipwrecks have been there and known since 1715. They came ashore. They were, they were salvaged in 1715 and 1716 and 1717. They got lost a little bit to history until uh, in, the, in the 1900s, but they, they weren't a secret. They weren't, they weren't lost at sea. Um, so uh, today, all the things the Treasure Coast is known for are really the leftovers from the salvage efforts that were done in the 1700s. Like the easy stuff to access, like well, loose coins and those kind well, of things? So when the ship sank, it sank up near the coast. So the Spanish and the French and anybody that could come along afterwards took as much off of those ships as they could. So what we found, what what uh, Mel Fisher found and all those guys found in, in south of here is the leftovers. It's what the Spanish didn't get, what they couldn't find, didn't have the technology at the time, didn't have the resources, got driven away for whatever reason, it didn't get recovered. So the, the hundreds of millions of dollars that have been recovered have been the leftovers. So what we're actually looking for off the Melbourne coast is, is one or more of the ships that sank at sea. They've never been found again. There were no survivors. So we don't exactly, you don't always know exactly where to look. Right. So you could spend years scanning and searching and scanning and searching. And the whole idea of the technology is it allows you to rule in or out areas quickly. Mm. So that's, it's, it's to change the economics of the search. And you have to start all the way back at the search right. until you get down to where you resolve down to dig here. And that's what we're that's what we're working towards. Now that's complicated by a very a very rig, a very regimented uh, regulatory process at the state when you're if you're within state waters. Yeah. So they have a very slow, methodical process you have to go through from an archaeological perspective. So you'd love to go out and scan and just dig. Oh, dig here, get my shovel or whatever I'm using on the ocean floor dredge or whatever, and dig. But you can't uh, because technically that's state waters. So you have to go file for a permit and then you have to wait the, and in some cases a year or more that you wait to get a permit. Right. And then you get that permit and then that only lets you do some things. Right. And then you could do some more things and some more things. So even finding a shipwreck <laughs> doesn't mean you get benefit from it tomorrow. Right. It might take you years to get the benefit from it. And that's why you want to have multiple shipwrecks going on in parallel, because you're always going to hit a regulatory stumbling block or a weather stumbling block or whatever stumbling block you're going to hit. You need to be able to get around it. And I think that's what most shareholders, most shareholders don't understand is that it's not, it's not, it's not as simple as um, we know where some stuff is. We're going to go. It's not that simple. It's not that simple at all. And those regulations are really driven by a general attitude of, of the archaeological community that believes there's a faction that believes that those shipwrecks should never be touched by humans again. Right. Mm. Okay. But having studied those artifacts that come up, okay, and how over time they are being consumed by the ocean, mm -hmm. it's not a time capsule. Right. It's not sitting there today like it sank in 1715 or 1550s it's or whatever. It's not King Tut's tomb. And just no, it is not King really Tut's burst. tomb right. sitting there. It is degrading, and eventually all of those artifacts, except for the gold, 
will be gone. Right. Gold is one of the few metals that comes out of the water the way it went in the water. Right. But silver will be consumed. Iron will be, anything iron-based will be consumed. All the wood is already, for the most part, consumed. So the, the concept of what they call in situ uh, conservation, which is just leave it there, is a false um, way of perceiving a historic shipwreck. It really should be properly mapped, excavated. Now, some of that's also driven by the fact that our own, within our own governments, the archaeological element within our governments is generally not well funded. Right. Mm. So they only have so many resources to deal with this stuff. Right. So to them, it, it, it's just you know typical civil servant thing. It's more work. Right. To have to deal with it than it is just to leave it there. So there, right. there's a there's a challenge on their part of being funded to do this work as well. Mm. Um, but you know to the extent that from a permitting perspective. We're an extension, actually, of the state's archaeological work out on site. Mm. 